I welcome you all to our first VBU, what the Virtual Bariatric University, episode one, an initiative from Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics. Uh, so it has always been our endeavor to spread knowledge and share skills, and in turn, we end up learning much more. So after having performed more than fourteen thousand procedures, we thought we are duty bound to share our experiences with the world. I would like to introduce our stellar group of faculties we have with us today. So I would first like to introduce Professor Wendy Brown. Uh, Professor Wendy Brown is uh, hi. <laughs> Professor Wendy Brown is the director of the Center for Obesity Surgery and Education and clinical lead for the National Bariatric Surgery Registry. She was the first woman to be appointed the chair of Monash University Department of Surgery in 2015. Professor Brown's area of expertise includes bariatric and upper gastrointestinal surgeries, including cancer and reflux diseases. She is the president elect of Australia and New Zealand's Gastroesophageal Surgery Association, and immediate past president of the Obesity Surgeon Society of Australia and New Zealand. So I welcome Professor Wendy Brown. Thank you very much. Our second panelist is Dr. Manish Khetan. Hi. So Dr Manish Khetan is the president of Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society of India. He is the director of No Obesity Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery Center. Dr Khetan has 15 plus years of experience in bariatric and metabolic surgery and 20 plus years of experience in other gastro and minimal invasive surgeries. So I welcome Dr Manish Khetan and I'm thanking both of you for uh, agreeing to participate in our course. Thank you so much. the next faculty is obviously uh, includes dr mathias phobi the man who needs no introduction first i would like to wish him a very happy birthday uh, today is his birthday thank you so he's uh, he's the and we are honored to have him as our director at uh, we are honored to have him as our director uh, at our center he's the director of clinical affairs so i welcome dr phobi and uh, the uh, operating surgeon will be dr mohit bhandari who is the founder director and chief surgeon of mohak bariatrics and robotics so now uh, we'll be starting our virtual bariatric meeting the first i welcome dr phobi to start with the first lecture thank you everybody welcome to this vbu webinar on preoperative endoscopy before bariatric surgery it's a hot topic at this time because of the realization that we are having gerd after sleeve gastrectomy and single anastomosis gastric bypass my lecture today is going to be an introduction into dr bandera's lecture and the procedure that he's going to perform i'll start by greeting you send you greetings from mohawk and same college where we are now in indore my disclosure is as above and a case mix of about 14000 cases in the last 10 years is as displayed on this slide pre operative endoscopy before bariatric operation bariatric and metabolic procedures alter the gastrointestinal tract some bariatric metabolic procedures also make access to parts of the gastrointestinal tract difficult or impossible should we therefore do a pre op endoscopy on all patients scheduled for bariatric surgery that is the question that is the hot topic what do we know at this time patients with class 1 2 and 3 obesity have increased incidence of gi pathology which includes gerd hyta hernia varices and esophageal and gastric cancer Sutter did pre-op endoscopy on 345 patients before bariatric operation. In 36% of the patients, he had reflux symptoms, and in 53 had hiatal hernia, in 31 had esophagitis. PA studies show that 52% had high DA masters scores. Monometry showed decreased lower esophageal sphincter pressure in 18% of patients. and there was an anomaly in the motility in 25% of the patients gomez also did a similar evaluation in 232 patients with egd before bariatric procedure 
45% of the patients had history of GERD, and 33% of them had symptoms at the time of the endoscopy. He had abnormal findings in 61% of the patients. Review of the literature shows that the incidence of abnormal EGDs before bariatric procedure ranges from 4.9% to 89.4%. What is the significance of pre-op endoscopy? It may change the findings. A patient's endoscopy might cause postponement of the procedure, change in the procedure, or for the surgeon to do additional procedures. It also would affect how the concern is discussed with the patient, depending on the findings on endoscopy. Gomez in his study found out that 35 patients had medical management alteration after the endoscopy, and four patients had surgical management canceled, postponed, or the procedure changed. A review of the literature shows that 1.7 to almost 61% of patients had change in their management after pre endoscopy, depending on the surgeons and the patient's discussion. So the pre endoscopy is relevant. What is the current opinion in the bariatric societies, bariatric community? Cynthia Buck from the UK did a survey of surgeons who do bariatric surgery and a significant number of them perform endoscopic evaluation pre bariatric surgery routinely. 50% of them selectively in patients with symptoms or depending on the planned procedure. And in a small percent of the surgeons who do bariatric surgery, they did not do any endoscopy at all. What is the present guidelines? The present guidelines are presently confusing. Most of them stress for individualized management, selective choice, except the EAS, EAES that recommends routine endoscopy. As you can see from 2015, ASMBS recommended selective preoperative endoscopy. And in a joint statement in 2015, the ASMBS with SAGES and ASG recommended selective endoscopy based on the patient's symptoms and the indication for surgery. However, this changed or is changing. This is not yet official, but this was submitted to us as members because the ASMBS position standard committee is looking at recommending routine endoscopy based on the fact that the literature shows that it is pertinent. So once this is approved sometime this year, we'll get a statement from ASMBS stating that routine preoperative EGD is justifiable. Similarly, if so came out this year, making the same recommendation on routine preop endoscopy. Are there disadvantages or disadvantages for preop endoscopies? The main disadvantage is that it entails two procedures currently, the endoscopy and then the bariatric procedure. It entails increased time for the endoscopy and time by the surgeon. And it is more demanding if the endoscopy is done by a gastroenterologist before the surgery. On the other hand, endoscopy is not that pleasant. It is usually done under cautious sedation and it entails additional cost. Are there any alternatives? At this time, you can do nothing. Or some have recommended that an upper GI series is an adequate evaluation of the GI tract before bariatric surgery because it's less costly. However, it exposes us to radiation, increased manpower, and has the limitations that biopsies and final mucosa details cannot be made. So at this time, we also know that patients develop pathologies after bariatric procedures, such as GERD, Barrett's esophagitis, esophageal, esophageal cancer, marginal ulcers, and hiatal hernias. So what do we conclude from the current status? 
Patients with obesity have increased risk of upper GI symptoms and pathology. They may be asymptomatic. Bariatric metabolic surgery may itself result in GI pathology and symptoms. Therefore, baseline documentation of upper GI appearance is important if future GI symptom pathology arise. We therefore are recommending that upper GI endoscopy should be done routinely. What is there for the future? Intraoperative pre-bariatric procedure endoscopy is being proposed as an effective, safe, and cost effective method to perform routine pre-op endoscopy on patients having bariatric surgery. Dr. Bandero will demonstrate how we perform this procedure and will also report on our findings after 2,000 plus consecutive cases. So I would like to thank Dr. Cynthia Buck for allowing me to use some of her slides and the staff at Mohawk who work with me and Dr. Bandari and help prepare these lectures and take care of the patients. At this time, I'll turn over to Dr. Bandari, who would uh, demonstrate both the surgical procedure of intraoperative endoscopy and present our findings from Mohawk. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everybody. Hi, Mohawk. How are you? How are you, Wendy and Dr. Manish? Thank you very much for joining us. So the plan is that I'll share his presentation and then uh, we, we go to the operating room live where I perform an intraoperative endoscopy with the procedure so that we understand what are the challenges which I'm gonna face. And then from there on, we go forward and uh, have the data from the Mohawk to have your comments uh, so that we can discuss about uh, why we are doing this. So just for all those viewers who have joined, uh, this particular uh, uh, presentation is probably by Dr. Phoebe was to explain uh, a different concept than what is being done across the world. So we all know uh, for different reasons that most of the centers would do a preoperative endoscopy and uh, this preoperative endoscopy would be done either by a gastroenterologist or by a surgeon at his uh, particular center. Uh, and that, uh, that case being said, then they would discuss these endoscopic findings with the uh, patient and then they would decide upon the procedure. Whereas what we do at Mohawk is something very different and very unique. Uh, we usually do uh, uh, the procedures of endoscopy intraoperatively and uh, these procedures uh, having been done intraoperatively, we have to take a blanket consent uh, that uh, uh, the patient might have a different procedure uh, being done uh, uh, from our center uh, that if suppose we have committed him a sleeve at our center, just depending upon the intraoperative findings, we might change the procedure at that particular stage. So let me take you through this presentation first. So this is a report from our center. Uh, we bring greetings. These are my disclosures. Uh, these are our case disclosures. But the most important part what I wanted to discuss is that why preoperative endoscopy is required in the very first place or why any endoscopy is required before we touch upon the uh, gastrointestinal anatomy. So we know that upper digestive diseases are at least two to three more times, uh, more times commoner in the morbidly obese patients. And that's probably the reason uh, why uh, we would very frequently find findings like esophagitis, gastritis, hiatus hernia, and several others in the morbidly obese patients. Also, it has been well published that uh, the routine uh, endoscopy before bariatric surgery in specifically in asymptomatic patients is still controversial. So there would be some centers who would not do it, would not recommend it because most patients would be, would be asymptomatic and still have findings. And some patients who are symptomatic will not have any findings. So uh, the issue is with the asymptomatic patients who would report to us without any findings and that's why uh, uh, there still is not a well-established path uh, about preoperative bariatric endoscopy. Uh, Hiatus hernia and reflux esophagitis are relative contraindications to sleeve, but again, we can admit it to the extent that most surgeons would repair the hiatus with a sleeve and the controversy goes on and there's no consensus between the surgeons. The preoperative endoscopy may result in alteration of surgical approach or maybe a delay in surgery in one to 9% of these patients. So that's uh, something which we all have to think that 
what is the alteration which is going to happen if 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 all of us are doing an endoscopy what alteration we going to have what sort of findings we going to face which would change the entire course of our procedure uh, now uh, if we see uh, uh, the uh, importance of or the significance of what we do at mohawk so we are doing intraoperative endoscopy instead of doing preoperative endoscopies or or endoscopy is being done by somebody outside our center so what is the advantage now this radical approach has the advantage of having minimal amount of discomfort to our patients it's a one time anesthesia so you need not have uh, you know patient given sedation outside and then he comes again and have another anesthesia it's very less time consuming for both the patient and the doctor the cost specifically is a constraint in india and that that gets reduced uh, very drastically uh, also we have uh, experienced that we have a very decreased a dropout rate at our center so for example i have i have had patients who had pre operative endoscopy like 8 8 years back when we were not following this protocol they shy away from surgery they either get threatened or they get afraid and then they don't turn up uh, they they feel as if you know uh, doing an endoscopy in sedation was very uncomfortable experience very unpleasant experience for them so that's something which we uh, you know uh, thought that maybe we uh, no uh, we have to principally change our approach and do something which is very different than what we are doing now so uh, 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 we decided to do intraoperative endoscopy and not preoperative and take a blanket consent from the patients that although based on your profile we have decided this procedure but if there is something which we find inside which is very different from what we feel we will change the uh, procedure and that can happen from 1 to 10% of the patients so that's that's a blanket consent uh, you know this is not only endoscopy but i have dr manish khatan is there wendy can comment and i i see that there are a lot of other surgeons joining us we have this we put in a scope and we see a cirrhotic liver but there was nothing reported on the ultrasound so we have to change from a bypass to a sleeve uh, similarly we go inside and there is a obstructed hernia there and the bowel is stuck in the hernia so we don't touch the bowel so even though if we committed to a gastric bypass we would go and do a sleeve so it's not only endoscopy but routinely you know there are certain situations where we have to change the procedure we decided same is with intraoperative endoscopy uh, now when i share my data it is very interesting you would realize how and why i did this and what are my results so then we can compare and you can criticize or we you can suggest us the way ahead this is just what we realized uh, during our 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 center what we did at our center now if we see what was the aim of this data which i am presenting the study uh, that to determine the feasibility safety and effectiveness of intraoperative pre bariatric surgery endoscopy the first aim the second was to determine the incidence of pathological findings we find before just before the surgery on the table before the patient undergo bariatric surgery and then the interesting part was to correlate these symptoms with the endoscopic findings and maybe to determine the incidence of patients whose planned surgery was altered because of this approach so very interesting approach everything is decided on the table patient is being asked to give a blanket consent that the procedure might change inside on the table depending upon the endoscopic findings and the wisdom of the surgeon so that's what is happening this is a prospective interventional study started on march 2018 and we collected data we are still collecting it but i am presenting the data till until february february 28 2020 we did routine intraoperative endoscopy in 1948 patients so which is 1900 patient is a huge data the patients were consented for endoscopy and the possibility of altering the choice of operation was discussed with the patient the alternative options were also consented by the patient so this is this is all which we which we took a ethical clearance for we discussed with the patient that we have to alter your your procedure depending on the endoscopic findings which will be present inside now you see these are 1948 patients we had to remove 86 patients whom we consented for that but we were not able to do it there were some patients who had single incision surgery so they we did not do the endoscopy some patients who were hepatitis hiv positive were removed so this these 86 patients are not the part of the study out of 1948 there was one unsuccessful attempt where we could not do an endoscopy the scope was not not getting negotiated all the this patient did not had an had a pathology and there was one patient with a very very large hiatus 
where you know the scope just got lost and we could not negotiate uh 10% were done by bariatric surgical consultants like myself or dr phobi and 90% was done by our surgical fellows so this is this is what happened here if you see this this uh, age age was around 44 years on an average uh, 53% of our patients were females uh, around uh, the rest were males the 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 weight and the bmi so 117 kilos was the average weight in this group and 44 was the average bmi in this group now this is interesting the findings which were there in patients who were symptomatic so these were patients who had symptoms uh, out of the 1900 some patients we we did out of them 24% of our patient uh, uh, had some findings which means that if if out, out of the 1900 some patients 350 patients were symptomatic only 84 of them uh, were having findings so this proves that if you have patients who are symptomatic not all are going to have findings on the endoscopy and this all of us know so just 24% another interesting thing asymptomatic patients which means pre operatively we never had a chance uh, of of detecting as per of the symptoms of the patient in them as per the history but again 25 of percent of them that is 351 out of 1377 patients again had some findings so you can see that 25% of asymptomatic patients will have finding and another 24% of symptomatic patients will have finding so this is very interesting which we find in both the cases symptomatic and asymptomatic now these were the findings if we see uh, esophagitis now let's talk about the symptomatic patients which complain of some symptoms like the gerd or maybe the they had some acid burn maybe burps or some some pain in the epigastric region 22 out of these 84 patients uh, had some or the other uh, problems like esophagitis 16.8% uh, had gastritis the bile and stomach was somehow the most common finding which we had so i think the bile and stomach might be responsible for their symptoms the bile gastritis you can say it's there in 81 patients duodenitis was detected in 23 and hiatus hernia in 17 so you find the figure common because some of the patients have combined uh, pathologies now if we go to the asymptomatic end where patient never had symptoms the findings were there in 7.1% or 98 patients uh, had findings of esophagitis 231 gastritis again the gastritis is a very common finding in asymptomatic patients you go inside in an asymptomatic patient put in a scope and you find some gastritis the bile in the stomach very common so this is one of the most common findings we see in both the set of the patient symptomatic and asymptomatic the bile is there in the stomach and that might be inconsequential we don't know the duodenitis in 82 and the hiatus hernia in 33 so this is this is the findings which we had we compared these findings with the existing set of studies i think there's a there's the same thing was reflected we had gastritis as the most common findings in most surgeons doing upper gi endoscopy pre operatively for a sleeve the esophagitis being the second most common and the third most common being the duodenitis with hiatus hernia taking the fourth position so you know we have a lot of studies but gastritis overall what we have seen in all these studies remain the most common finding in patients who undergo endoscopy for a sleeve gastrectomy uh, now if we see here what happened with us we had patients we had to change a plan on table so if a patient for an instance had a sleeve plan we had to change it to a gastric bypass and that we had to change to a gastric bypass because uh, uh, we find findings which were not permitting us to do a sleeve like we had a hiatus hernia in 13 of these patients we had esophagitis in seven of these patients so we had to change our plan in in, in a similar way uh, we had to change a plan from gastric bypass to a one anastomosis or a sleeve because we find a peptic ulcer disease in 29 22 patients had gastritis some had gastric ulcers some had duodenitis so from a gastric bypass the plan changed to sleeve here because if you have somebody with active duodenitis or a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer or a polyp as we see in three three cases here we cannot do a gastric bypass because then there is no way we can do the surveillance of this particular patient for the future so here plan from gastric bypass change to sleeve so if you see uh, out of the 1900 odd patients we had to change a plan from sleeve 
to a gastric bypass in 15 because of the pathologies and from gastric bypass or one anastomosis to sleeve in 32 patients. So this is in total number 47. Now, if you divide 47 by 1900 patients we did, this number turns out to be 2.7%, which means that the plan in 98% of the patient did not change. Two point some percent, or you can say 97% did not change. 3% patient, we had to change the plan on the table where some had to be converted to a gastric bypass and some from gastric bypass to the sleeve. And the reasons, as you can see, we could not perform a sleeve because of grade three esophagitis, hitus, and reasons like that. And similarly, we could not perform a gastric bypass of one anastomosis because of polyps and very high level of duodenitis, which we saw. So that's what uh, was our findings. Uh, in short, I would conclude that intraoperative endoscopy is one of the suggested approach by our center, which is doable, cost-effective, safe, convenient for both patient and surgeon, and helps in diagnosis of asymptomatic UGI pathologies like severe esophagitis, gastric ulcers, polyps, which altered the plan in our case in 2.7% of patients. The solution to this controversy on, on whether to do an endoscopy is probably intraoperative endoscopy is what we suggest. Am I audible? Yes, no. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. So we are now in the theater and uh, I would like to uh, now like to invite <laughs> Dr. Mehek Bhandari, our consultant at Bariatric, uh, Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics. He'll be giving you the case history and he'll be sharing the case details with you. So over to Dr. Mehek. Good evening, everyone. So this particular case is a 30-year-old male with a height of 159 centimeters and weight of 126.8 kgs with a BMI of 50. Diet is non-vegetarian. He has no history of any addictions. As far as comorbidities are concerned, Last year. As far as comorbidities are concerned, he has osteoarthritis, OSA, hypertriglyceridemia, type 2 diabetes since one and a half years on OHAs, and recently diagnosed hypothyroidism. So, as far as blood investigations are concerned, the hemoglobin standards 13, the protein levels are 8.29, the LDL levels are 178, highly raised, the triglycerides are 333. ESH is 6.12 and HbA1c is 6.78 and RT-PCR COVID-19 testing and CT scoring are negative. So as for the routine protocol, Dr. Mohit Bhandari will be showing you the intra-op endoscopy to rule out any pathology before starting the surgery because as he said in his lecture that we can have a change of plan if at all any pathology has been detected in the intra-op endoscopy. So now you will be seeing the intra-op endoscopy picture. So over to Dr. Mohit. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me first? Yes. Okay. Is the voice clear or it's not very clear? It's yeah. clear, but speak up a little bit. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to demonstrate the intraoperative endoscopy here. So Dr. Mehek has already explained you about the patient details. So this is quite a huge patient, you know, very difficult neck. I'm in the esophagus now. Uh, Let's try to go inside and see if we have some findings which precludes performing a uh, the G junction is exactly at 40 centimeters. Uh, that's the Z line. As you can see, uh, I go inside there and I have this beautiful stomach. Uh, I don't see even gastritis here. Almost looks normal to me. Uh, this is the pre-pyloric area, fine. I'm going to go inside into the duodenum and see if there is a pathology here. So most duodenal pathologies we usually detect while we pull the scope back. So I'm going to pull the scope a little back here while we search for any pathologies. I don't find any pathologies here. Duodenum looks okay. I come back and then I retroflex my scope to check if I have a problem there with the hiatus. The hiatus looks fine. Uh, I will do a little bit of suction here. 
so that i remove this fluid from the fundus of the stomach i can go back there and once i come back i just evacuate all the air so that's the endoscopy which i performed i don't feel that it precludes uh, mini gastric bypass now i am going to put ports to this patient to perform the mini bypass so we going to perform a one anastomosis here uh let me show you the condition of the bowel so uh this is our so just focus on the abdomen for now in the pip and uh then we'll have the endoscopic view which can go inside the main screen so uh the first step which we going to do after we put in a scope is ask our anesthetist to again put a gastric calibration tube and remove all the uh, fluid which is there inside the stomach so he is going to put a tube in the meantime we put the ports i don't see a lot of dilatation of the bowel i think the bowel looks fine i can perform any bowel associated procedure here so uh if you can see we have put an optical port i'm not going to focus too much on the uh one anastomosis part because this is more dedicated lecture towards the intraoperative endoscopy uh, and the feasibility of the intraoperative endoscopy uh, plus if we have difficulties in performing uh, bariatric procedures on super obese patients so i'm going to focus more on the uh, endoscopic part dealing with uh, bowel and pathologies and uh, things of that sort uh just to give you a brief recap we had an endoscopy which turned out to be normal we had no gastritis the g junction was fine it was at 40 cm no esophagitis uh we had a uh, uh, a nice pre pyloric area with the pylorus open no bile in the stomach the duodenum first part second part looked normal uh, while putting uh, the scope in a retroflex position we could not find a hiatus so almost a normal endoscopy like we expected uh so the ports are in as you can see in the pip we have uh, around four ports two ports uh, 12 mm on the left side in mid clavicular line on the right side again mid clavicular line two finger breadths above the optical port and we are ready to perform the procedure uh, but the first step before performing the procedure uh, the anesthetist would come in put in the bougie and would suck all the fluid which is present into the fundal area so you can see this is the fundus and i usually put more water than air while i do these procedures so that's the first step we want to evacuate so we ask the anesthetist to come in and he is evacuating all this fluid from that particular part so that's it take it out the fluid is evacuated we have this nice stomach here i can easily perform the endoscopy and so is the situation of the bowel let me just show you the bowel it's fine it does not creates problem in pneumoperitoneum or the space for us to do any procedure now let me start the procedure it's going to be a short procedure because we just going to do a one anastomosis this is the area of the uh prostate we're going to go here make a space to enter into the lesser sac you know one anastomosis is a shorter procedure because it's just one anastomosis so we usually would not have to uh, do a lot of dissection close to the g junction you can see i have entered into the lesser sac i take a stapler and the first one i fire usually is a gold uh, we had a very nice course just around 2 days back dedicated to one anastomosis with some australian group of surgeons where i demonstrate around five procedures including one revision on one anastomosis gastric bypass and there also we demonstrated a lot of these endoscopic procedures so this is the first fire done around 2 cm from the pylorus so this is the pylorus there's the first part of the duodenum there is the cbd there and then uh, we just go with a blue cartridge way up doing the division so this is the remnant here and we always pay attention that the remnant remains here to drain properly so that we do not have issues uh now i am going to ask my anesthetist to bring in the bougie and uh, just will first lock 
the stapler so that he gets an easy passage because sometimes the anesthet is bringing in the bougie because of a large dilated fundus can remain there and struggle in the area of the fundus so you can see the bougie coming in very swiftly it goes inside and now we can just continue with our firings yeah, i usually use a 38 french bougie because that's what is available in india and we usually do not go very close or above to the bougie either because this is sort of a, a non obstructed bypass procedure so that's what is going on at the end of the procedure once i perform the anastomosis i'm going to demonstrate you the endoscopic finding what intra operative anatomy we created and how does it look on endoscopy immediate post operatively so we also check for some bleeding if it is there some oozing inside and uh, if we have some oozing from the site of the anastomosis or the site of uh, the area where we fired the stapler the junction between the small bowel and the uh, uh, stomach so that's what we have to see this liver is not one of the best livers i would appreciate for a live case uh, it's not that that good a liver but still we are going on we are firing and you can see that we have almost reached the g junction i think that should be the ultimate firing maybe the penultimate one uh, i would need some anesthetic agent to be given to the patient the patient is light so that would help me now if we see here uh, uh, this is the area of the g junction i'm almost there and uh, the best way here is i usually would not dissect a lot close to the g junction but i would come and close this as i am doing here so that's my last firing and i am done with my division of the stomach i can put a gauze there most of this bleeding is going to stop by the end of the procedure we just put a gauze there the patient is light so the blood pressure is a little high we have already requested our anesthetist to put him back to sleep that can often happen when we uh, do now this is the posterior part of the stomach so you can see that we have a lot of fat here i'm going to remove this fat and uh, dissection is done so that we do not encounter bleeding while we fire the staple here because this fat usually is um a little thicker than what we expect now this is a gastrotomy i do posterior to the staple line with the anesthetist helping to push the bougie in we can see the blue of the bougie there so that's the gastrotomy done now the most important part is to count this bowel so i have markings done on my graspers both the graspers will have markings so you can see this is a 10 here and i can have another grasper with the marking so these are both 10 marked here now what i wanted to express even before the bowel is not that dilated you can see and you know usually what i realize that even if we have some air which comes from the duodenum to the small bowel it's just the initial 10 cm so that's uh, that's the patient there we would want anesthetist to supine uh, and make the patient a little straight so that we can trace the anatomy so that anatomy can be demonstrated to all of you now this is the ligament of trites i don't see inferior mesenteric vein because of a lot of fat but nevertheless let's count start to count so that's 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 90 100 110 120 110 120 110 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 120 
here and then we make use this gastrotomy to do the anastomosis i i always request my anesthetist to take out the bougie only when i am inside with the stapler because it aids in helping me to you know get a little more closer to the area i need to enter my staple into so that's a posterior gastrointestinal anastomosis we'll clean our camera once i always uh, would not uh, uh, go ahead and do a procedure if the camera is not clean so we clean it once so that i can see and demonstrate better we are again inside and now i can just repair this and do an endoscopy for all of us to see how the internal anatomy looks like as far as the feasibility of doing an intraoperative endoscopy i think i demonstrated that yes a mini gastric bypass is feasible we can do a bypass procedure after doing a intraoperative endoscopy because i feel that the bowel was not that dilated uh, stomach had a little fluid uh, as i could see which was very nicely evacuated by our anesthetist so that's fine now that gives us the freedom of i was actually you know in the morning i was discussing with my team that we might have to change the procedure uh, considering the fact that there would be some findings and i had this gut feeling but this time my gut feeling was wrong and we never had findings to convert this into a sleeve uh, otherwise that would have been a learning for us that procedures do have to change as i said uh, in with our own data which i already expressed and we'll discuss with dr wendy brown and dr khatan as to what is their experience uh, we had to change this uh, procedure which we plan only in just say around mm, maybe 2% as i demonstrated 2.7% exactly uh, not not very common and and i have never had a patient who complained because uh, at the end of the day they understand that the best thing Uh, for them lies in the hand of the surgeon and that's what they consent for so uh, they they just say that you know whatever is the best you feel now for example i this, this liver is not as bad it's 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 a fatty liver but not 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 cirrhotic per se for example i would have entered inside the last case which i did just before this uh, vbu started was uh, supposedly a, a a a gastric bypass which i had to do a banded bypass but we entered inside and the liver was badly cirrhotic although nothing was re reported on the ultrasound scans um, it was just mild fatty liver so the findings are so different uh, when you see them intraoperatively on a uh, laparoscopic visualization and that changed the entire course of my way of dealing with that patient and i had to change the procedure from a bypass to a sleeve because uh, that was a bad liver i took a biopsy of the liver and then um, you know uh, changed the procedure the port position is a little challenge uh, if you have a normal endoscopy uh, where you wanted to do a, a bypass but you end up having a very very bad liver once you put the first scope uh, if you have put other scopes but if you put a optical port first like most centers do and then do a scopy and then put other ports and your optical port doesn't change for a sleeve or a bypass then that's that's not a problem you can obviously uh, tackle that so this is done the mini bypass is over we never close uh internal hernia defects in our mini bypass because we never had the incidence of internal hernia in odd 4000 cases done i'm going to go do an endoscopy and then i'm going to shift myself to the studio uh for discussion uh on what we did when we do an endoscopy post operatively we block both the limbs so both these limbs will be blocked by my assistant using a grasper i'm already with my endoscope Uh, what i need to check is if i have any bleed significant bleed inside if i have some other problem so this is the esophagus you can find that there's a little bit of blood can i have the pip view shift to okay great i have a little bit of blood here so i'm going to suck it this usually would come because of the bougie bringing in the blood this is my staple line um looks okay i'm going to go inside this is the anastomosis you can see So that's the anastomosis which we created it does not look like bleeding this is the efferent loop and there there is the 
our front loop. I take this scope back so you can see both the loops very nicely. That's the beautiful anastomosis. It does not bleed. This is the staple line. When I pull the scope back, 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 back. So that's not bleeding either. There's a small oozing here. I think that would settle down with time. So I'm going to just remove my scope. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I'm going to come to the studio. In the meantime, Dr. Phoebe can interact with Wendy and uh, Dr. Khetan, and I can bring my questions back. I'll, I'll go to the studio in just in a minute's time. So over to Dr. Phoebe. I'm sharing my video. Okay. All right. Thank you. Excellent presentation of interoperative endoscopy followed by the bariatric procedure. Uh, the assistant consultant is going to measure the length of the pouch intraoperatively. So that is also documented. And uh, we didn't want to take your time to demonstrate all of that. And then the momentum that was taken under the pouch would be take brought down to the normal anatomy. So uh, we don't leave it up back there. And then um, as Dr. Bandera says, we do not do Hello. internal hernia repair. So at this time, uh, as Dr. Bandera goes to the studio, I would uh, turn it over to Dr. Wendy Brown and Manish Katan if they have any questions or comments. I have, I have to put my video on. You have to help me out. I am not able to. Okay. okay. I'm allowing you. So yeah, please, I think. So please ask your, uh, uh, share your video. Okay. Bottom of your left to advance it. There's a screen down there. Yeah. A pointer. An arrow. Okay, Wendy, you were going to make a comment while we wait. Oh, it was very, um, a very nice demonstration um, of the endoscopy and also the procedure. So, you know, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting looking at your very large case series of preoperative um, endoscopy that um, the asymptomatic and symptomatic patients who ended up having pathology was very similar to what we found in the systematic review associated with the if so position statements are around 25 no. percent and um, similarly I think in the if so position statement there were around about 0.4 percent where we found an absolute contraindication to surgery such as a cancer on the systematic review but there was about 16 percent where treatment was delayed and that was um, or changed um, I note that you, you change your procedures about four percent of the time but what about if you saw something that needs to be treated um, or potentially should be treated before you proceed with the bariatric procedure, like a severe reflux esophagitis or um, gastritis, for that matter, or a gastric ulcer, would you pull out in that circumstance? Mohit, do you want to answer that or you want yeah. me to? Uh, uh, yeah, can, can, I, can you repeat your question, Wendy? I'm sorry. Sure. I just... Yeah, no, no problems. So, in the if so position statement, around about when we did the systematic review, we identified about 16% of the time that a preoperative um, endoscopy altered the management. It didn't necessarily stop them proceeding, but it either meant there was a delay whilst an ulcer was treated, gastritis was treated, or um, esophagitis was treated, or the same as what you were describing, perhaps they changed from a sleeve to a bypass or a bypass to a sleeve. Now, when you do your endoscopies at the time of the um, index operation, how often would you need to pull out to treat something like esophagitis or a gastric ulcer? Yeah. Not just change your procedure, but change your management. Yeah. Very nice question, Wendy. I think uh, that's, that's an important predicament which one can face. Uh, we had aborted procedures in certain special circumstances. The first, if we find a duodenal growth. So if we find a duodenal growth or esophageal growth or a growth in the gastric part, uh, any part of the stomach, maybe fundus or maybe anywhere, we would usually go for a narrow band imaging followed by a biopsy of that particular lesion. Although we have a frozen facility, but at that stage, we do not move ahead with the procedure. That's one circumstance. 
for treating esophagitis for treating gastric ulcers i would say i never had an occasion where we had an ulcer which was a bleeding ulcer or a ulcer which was badly infected that we had to completely postpone the procedure and get back again after two or three months or maybe treating that and get to an, another opd endoscopy and come back we never had such an occasion the only one occasion we had one not not one means one the only one type of occasion we had to change the course of what we are doing is when we found growths which we have the facility of frozen section but having said that because we are not cancer specialists here uh, we don't deal with cancers here we would take a biopsy uh, obviously send it for a frozen but send the main biopsy and call it a day for that particular case then the patient would come back once we have uh, those biopsies uh, at some time having said that i have had issues of finding the most common thing was a gastrointestinal stromal tumor and 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 we have uh, when we have uh, we have had that uh, we started them with imitinib mesylate and then call them after 6 months and the lesion almost disappears as you know that these these medications can treat the gist tumors once we have done the immunotyping and all those things but again this is not a part of my uh, my expertise uh, i am a pure bariatric surgeon so i don't deal with malignancies i abort the procedure uh, esophagitis uh, mild ulcers mild esophagitis or even severe esophagitis uh, duodenal polyps uh, have been reported we obviously biopsy the polyps uh, but they do not change the uh, they do not abort the procedure we do not abort the procedure we just go ahead and change the procedure as i mentioned uh, in my data right and how do your patients cope with the consent process um i'm um, when i was a junior surgeon when we used to deal with breast cancers we do needle biopsies or biopsies on the table and the patients didn't know what operation they were going to wake up with until um we got the frozen section back and we stopped doing that because the patients didn't cope well with not knowing what procedure they they were going to undergo whether or not it was going to be a mastectomy or a lumpectomy um or nothing if it came back as benign so we moved to doing preoperative biopsies so i guess using that example how do your patients feel about the fact that they may get a sleeve or they may get a mini bypass or one anastomosis bypass sorry i should say or they may get a raw myogastric bypass do they yeah, do you yeah. think they worry about that yeah wendy that's a that's a very very good question actually you know uh, i i have had this uh, different experience than the western world here in india uh my patients do not worry about that i can tell you very honestly i uh, you know dr phobi he has been with me for four years before the pre phobi era for me uh my patient used to get the procedure he wanted but after dr phobi came in he taught me to decide as a surgeon the procedure which is the best for the patient not to give the patient what patient wants to so i for one person would sit with him in the counseling room myself and would show him my data that see this is my data of intraoperative endoscopy uh, we have had chances of as high as 3 percent to change the procedure but if we are changing the procedure which is planned for you from a sleeve to a bypass intraoperatively that's for your good it, it is for your future it is for what is going to stay with you for 40 50 or 100 years not not for us to you know not for our, for a benefit to us so that's one thing that that we make them understand that sleeve is a reflexogenic procedure and and if you have a sleeve with a severe esophagitis you have full chances chances of getting converted that esophagitis into birrets and that birrets into a malignancy similarly if you have a duodenal polyp there and somehow we lose the access to the first part of the duodenum because of a gastric bypass then god forbid and you have that malignancy which grows and then you come up with a stage 4 lesion then we have nothing in our hands but to do a chemo and do a palliation for you so so you know wendy it's it's both the ways it's how you counsel your patient so i have decided and if if some some of my you know i had this initially when just dr phobi joined i was very reluctant to this idea of 
you know asking the patient to let it be my choice to decide the procedure so forget about endoscopy if a patient turns to my clinic with a particular profile i decide the procedure patient would not decide the procedure and if the patient decide the procedure then he decides the surgeon and not me because then he decides the surgeon he wants to choose which he can happily go to any other center and do it but if he comes to our center we decide the procedure and the freedom to change it intraoperatively and to be very honest with you it has only increased the trust uh and the credence of me as a surgeon in front of my patient because when i change the procedure i take him through the videos show him the endoscopic findings and then decide that now i am changing a procedure and and we are not talking about endoscopy let's talk about the liver that's that's more common a situation where you in the ultrasound scans you because we don't do regular elastographies for all our, all our patients except for if there's a need it's a cost to us so we we just ask them to do ultrasound scan and if it does not report anything more than a fatty liver we go inside put in a scope and we find it's it's cross cirrhosis and and those cases if the patient consented for a one anastomosis we're not going to go ahead and do a one anastomosis and have him you know land up having a liver transplant 6 months after our procedure because one anastomosis causes rapid rapid weight loss so i for one would tell him that you know there are situations which a surgeon is posed inside the operating room where the surgeon decides the best in the favor of the patient he is just like your you know somebody who takes care of you is the closest person to the patient he is there he would decide it for you and i i have not a single patient had refused me they have taken it very positively in fact it has led patients saying to other patient that dr bhandari has a algorithm dr phobi and dr bhandari sits with an algorithm they do not do the procedure or perform the procedure which is technically easier or simpler everything is easier and everything is difficult they do what is best suited for us and i am one person i share my algorithm with all my patients you know openly it's it's shared on our osi group it's shared with all our team our fellows and everybody and and the patient reads it and they find logic in it and then they think that what we are doing for them is the best so that that answers your question there it's very positive i've never had a patient who have refused me or you had problems and they was they started grumbling no it never it all depends upon how you counsel them preoperatively these problems would tend to happen if you commit them falsely of a procedure and you don't inform them that you, that you can change the procedure intraoperatively so i think we have a very very important informed consent session a confidence building session which uh, helps us you know stay away from uh, problems uh great mohit if you all can hear me may i i am allowed to ask you something yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. thank you mohit for a great presentation and putting an insight into the intraoperative endoscopy as wendy has correctly mentioned i have also gone through the ifso statement if to if so position statement about preoperative endoscopy and in that if correct me if wendy i am wrong 7.6% there is a change in plan of surgery if you do a pre surgery endoscopy in contrast to 2.7% on table endoscopies so there is a quite a difference of 5% you know so this change of plan is because esophagitis as she has mentioned there is esophagitis there can be a change of plan which has the patient has to be explained afterwards so this change of plan is not going to affect our final outcome i suppose mohit yeah yeah it's not going to affect our final outcome absolutely i i i would say i would say that uh, you know in fact it would be positive if we change the procedure intraoperatively in the favor of the patient it's going to be more positive outcomes i would say um, and as you have already told you take a very good consent you explain them very well and uh, you make a plan go inside you can change your plan after changing your plan have you ever seen a patient who is who is suppose you have planned an ngb and you go inside and you do a sleep and the patient is a super super obese patient so then what can be the next plan if the patient doesn't loses weight properly or you know 
you do a re-endoscopy, assess that polyp again, and if it is not turning into a cancer, you can have a MGB at a later date or something like that. Yeah, that's a that's a very valid step which we all take. I mean, I I have done a um, lot of sleeves on super obese patients, and all of them would come back to us irrespective after five years to get it revised into some of the other procedure. And I think you correctly mentioned that we can regularly endoscope them. And if it does not turn out to be a malignant lesion and we are sure, um, we can obviously go ahead and maybe arrange a polypectomy for them and then maybe follow up endoscopies and then go ahead and we can do a bypass procedure as a revision next stage procedure. There's no harm in that. I agree. Uh, I, 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 I sort of, uh, you know, if we talk about sleeve or a mini gastric bypass in super obese patients, both of them would good good weight loss in the first one year or so, which is the surveillance period for these sort of lesions, which we you know need to follow. So patients are mostly satisfied even if we change the procedure because the weight loss is not too much of a difference between the two. Uh, but uh, I feel that the problems which we would face if we do not change the procedure and stick to what we have promised uh, then specifically, you know, I'm more concerned about uh, high grades of esophagitis, uh, hiatus hernia, where surgeons I have seen uh, would even in large hiatus would repair the hiatus and do a sleeve for the heck of doing it. I think Dr. Phobie can comment on it, but I don't feel that, you know, that should be done uh, because in the longer run, we will have patients who would have more complaints than uh, having positive attitude towards what we have done for them. So. No, that, that's my. What is your opinion, Doctor? Oh, basically, uh, you two things. You raised the higher incidence from the ISO report. When we encounter gastritis or os incidence of ulcers, we let those patients get a sleeve, and that is why we other centers would treat that patient medically before they subject them to the sleeve. Uh, we have not found that that has been a problem because all of our patients are on PPI for six weeks to three months or even longer, whether they have gastritis or not. The second aspect is we have an algorithm. So for instance, in a super obese patient like this, if we'd gone in and uh, we had planned to do an MGB, and we find out that the patient has contraindications by having a high hernia or has esophagitis, then we'll do a bypass, but we won't do a routine bypass. We'll do a banded bypass because our data, our statistics shows that a banded bypass is as effective as the one anastomosis gastric bypass at five to six years follow up. We wouldn't do a routine gastric bypass because we know that in 30% plus, the gastric bypass patients start failing at four and five years. So if we have a patient, on the other hand, who we went in to do an MGB and found the patient had gastritis and peptic ulcer uh, problems, and we decide to do a sleeve, at that time we do a bandage sleeve because our data so far shows that the bandage sleeve is as equal to the one anastomosis gastric bypass at five and six years follow up. So it allows us to see the rest of that gastrointestinal tract, treat them for ulcer disease, and yet not have a remnant stomach which is not accessible. So that combining the technique we have now, plus our algorithm, all of these things are discussed with the patients preoperatively. And then when the surgery is done, if there's a change, we take the endoscopic findings and the laparoscopic findings, and we sit down with the patient and say, look, this is what we told you. This is what we found, and that's why we changed it. The patients feel they're part of the informed consent. And uh, when I first came to India with Dr. Bandari, we were used to people walking in, like going to a grocery store or a pharmacist and demanding, I want to sleep. And I told him, you're not a doctor, you're not a surgeon, you are a salesman. Mm -hmm. And the patient is making the choice of the color of the pizza or the hamburger, the size they want. You should be able to evaluate the patient and treat the patients appropriately. Occasionally the patients will want something and insist on it. We would have to weigh the consequences. We are talking about probabilities here. 
So a patient with GERD symptoms has a high probability of near GERD and problems, but it's not 100%. So if you have a patient who has symptoms of GERD and you recommend a gastric bypass and the patient absolutely does not want a gastric bypass, then you advise that patient, we're going to do your operation, but this is the curve we have. This is our experience with the sleeve without the band. You're going to have excellent weight loss from 60 to 80 percent, but in three years, you're going to start gaining weight. Do you understand that? You say, yes, then you have to come back and we might have to do a gastric bypass, a mini gastric bypass or a CD. The patient will say, like, I'll take my chance. And that is part of the informed consent. So we're not dictatorial. But what has been impressive is that when we have informed the patients adequately, most of them are given preoperative pre consents as to what choice we make at surgery. And most of them will be happy, at least all of them that we have converted, have been happy with the conversion. Yeah, great. Thank you. I have a last question. Uh, what about H. pylori infection, which is very rampant in this part of the world? A lot of times postoperatively also we have seen that the patient has a nagging pain, comes out with the HP positive, and then we have to give drugs. So during surgery, I have read your paper, Mohit. We are excluding H. pylori. We are not doing biopsies. And in a normal stomach, the H. pylori postoperatively can sometimes, in our series, 0.8 to 1%, it can create problem, ulcers, and nagging pain. So what's your opinion about it? Yeah, that's, that's something when we started doing uh, intraoperative endoscopy, that was one thing which created doubt in my mind that, you know, we are not taking biopsies. But then I went through all the data. Uh, there is actually no consensus on that. I mean, uh, most surgeons would treat it empirically and would not you know, change or would not abort a procedure, go ahead and do a procedure. What I decided personally is that if we have found severe gastritis, in all such cases, we just do a sleeve. Because if you leave a remnant with very severe gastritis, uh, there is no access available. So most severe forms of gastritis, we have taken some biopsies and we send them and then we do a sleeve and then treat them if the biopsy turns out to be positive for H. pylori or whatever it is. In any case, now our protocol determines that we give six months of antacids to all our patients who are on sleeves and almost lifelong antacids to patients who are on mini bypass and around one year antacids to patients who are on gastric bypass. But if we find severe gastritis or a gastric ulcer which is infected, in fact, the infected gastric ulcer which, which has active infection, that case I would abort, I would not touch it. Or an infected duodenal ulcer which has, you know, pus on the base, no healthy granulation, I, I would abort that case like I would do for a of a, a mass lesion or something but as far as i'm concerned uh, i would i never found some data which could suggest that first treat h pylori and then do these bariatric procedures or it's it's something which is a norm or something which suggests that there is sufficient data to say that no you cannot operate upon patients with gastritis first take a biopsy do a h pylori test treat them and then call them back again so that that's that's what is my answer to your question uh, I have one other question which was related to the previous question which Wendy asked is that maybe what you do at, in India is your cultural issue, you know. Culturally, maybe the patients are like agreeing to what doctor says. Uh, yes, that, that may be true. Uh, but, you know, I gave a very different answer when Dr. Phoebe asked me to do this. I said, no, my culture does not permit me this. So, so don't, don't force me into doing something which Indian culture does not permit. And, and what Dr. Phoebe said, try it for a month and the Indian culture would permit. And then I tried it for a month and then I thought, oh, this culture permits. So at the end of the day, you know, culture is, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's how you do the counseling, how you confirm and, you know, put an impression upon your patient and how you build that confidence. That's more, more important than the cultural variation. You see, I came to that decision back in the States when uh, the VBG became very popular. I did the first prospective randomized study between the gastric bypass and the VBG. And the initial weight loss was very impressive. And Dr. Mason, the father of uh, gastric bypass, was pushing for the VBG. 
and I just stood my ground. That is why many times when you talk to people, they may think that I founded the gastric bypass. No, Dr. Mason did. As a matter of fact, I got introduced to the gastric bypass 10 years after Dr. Mason. The difference is that when everybody abandoned the gastric bypass in the 70s, uh, 78, starting with the VBG and the gastroplasty, and I did the study, I went back to gastric bypass. And the 80s, for most of the 80s, I was one of the few centers that did gastric bypass while everybody was doing VBG. And I found out that the patients were happy when I told them why I was doing such a complicated procedure. Because patients used to come in looking for the gastric bypass or the adjustable band and say, that's what I want. I said, sorry, I won't do it because these are the results. And I found out that more than 90% of the patients that were convinced stayed with me and those who weren't went somewhere else. And with that, I've learned and other surgeons have learned to become proactive, to be the decision makers, to be the scientists. And when I came to India, I found the same resistance. But after a while, Dr. Bandera realized it and the patients want to be part of the decision making. And if you try it in your practice, you would. Most surgeons who turn the responsibility to the patients are salesmen. They want to do a sleeve, a quick procedure. And I said, the patient came and asked for a sleeve, so I gave it to him. But the patient is going to come back five years later with weight regain. Is that fair? Or, and I think the limitation is most surgeons have not taken the time to learn how to do the various procedures. That's the beautiful thing at Mohawk Bioretic and Robotic Surgery Center. We're able to do gastric bypass, MGBs, sleeves, banded gastric bypass, banded MGBs, SADIS. And at this time, we do endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy for some patients who want it, who request it. Some of them really have indication because they have BMI between 27 and 35. Some of them don't really have the indication because they have a BMI of 45 to 50, but they don't want surgery. We do that and we tell them, you're gonna come back for the real procedure. And believe it or not, it ends up being a good converter for patients who come in with a big BMI one and ECG, ESG. They lose that 19 kilo, kilograms or 17 kilograms and they gain the weight back and it's okay, I'm coming now for the real thing. So, uh, it's nice to have the various bariatric procedures in your armamentarium. Any other, any other audience? Somebody, I see you, Dr. Yeah. Ugale is with us. Yeah, Dr. Ugale is there. The comments? He asked the question asked about the things. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I really enjoyed all this. I had asked some questions on the side, but since they were not being answered, I thought maybe I had better ask them myself. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, okay, one of the points was that Mohit, you've never had a problem with dilatation of the bowel at all, ever, after doing the endoscopy? Uh, no, I, you know, if, if I would say we have done now almost like 3,000 cases, one, not more than one to 10, you can say, it. I, I could not remember very honestly. Plus, I could say that even if I had some dilatation, to be honest, yeah. That was there in on the first 15 to 20 centimeters of the bowel from the DJ flexion. You mentioned and, that. Yeah. yeah. And that's usually the area where we do not perform these anastomoses. So the air, plus I don't use air. I use carbon dioxide insufflation. And we, you know, I feel that if you're using carbon dioxide insufflation and giving 100% oxygen to the patient, this gets absorbed pretty, pretty fast, very fast. So, I, I, for one reason, would feel, yes, sometimes when you have a duodenal polyp or an ulcer there, which you want to uh, sort of see carefully doing a narrow band imaging. Uh, I had issues where I had some air, but I never had air beyond 25 to 30 centimeters of my bowel, which okay. would create problems. Uh, having said that, if somebody has that kind of a problem, I came out with certain solutions for that. Now, like, uh, like, for example, if we are doing a gastric bypass and for instance, you have some dilatation, uh, I always do the pouch first. Yeah. So that gives time for the carbon dioxide to absorb. And by the time I'm down in the infracolic compartment, it's all gone. Okay. The reason I, I asked you this is because, uh, and the background is that, I have been doing endoscopies for a long, long time. 
I mean, I've learned from Professor Shrikande that uh, surgeons, uh, uh, and this was ever since uh, or before the president of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Royal College of Edinburgh had said in his address that surgeons need to do endoscopy. And this was way back. Now, uh, so I've been actually used to doing this. Now, in one of the patients some years ago, when we uh, had planned a, a, an ideal interposition for this patient, we, we did the endoscopy. And, and we came out, and then when we went in with the laparoscope, uh, he probably his, uh, what we had advised him for preparation, maybe he didn't follow it or whatever, but the small bowel was so dilated that I gave up uh, uh, the procedure. I went, I did only the sleeve at that time, and I told him after some time, we'll go ahead with the ileal interposition. But this gentleman never showed up. After that, he went on saying, yes, he'll come back, but he never came back. So, so what we do now is, uh, a lot of the times we do an intraoperative endoscopy, as you've shown. We go in with the, uh, with the laparoscope and one or two other ports. And then with a the grasper, we place it on the duodenum and then do the endoscopy. And only when we want to have a look in the first part of duodenum and second part, we quickly go in and come out. And again, have the grasper there. So now we've ensured that we never have any dilatation of the small bowel ever. So I just thought I'd share that experience uh, with you about that. In fact, in fact, Dr. Phoebe suggested me this. What you are saying, he suggested me to block the duodenum. <laughs> I, I assured him that I won't have a problem without even blocking it. He, in fact, this was what he, he primarily taught me that you can block the duodenum and it's very easy. It's not that difficult, you know, and, and you, you need, need not put a lot of pressure there. Like you said, go there, observe the stomach. And then once you have to go inside the duodenum, just remove it a little bit and then not too much of air goes. Uh, honestly, I never had uh, such problems. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, why we, uh, we were, when we were, while we were doing these procedures in, in some of our initial uh, cases by the fellows specifically. We had problems of dilatation, a lot of these. Uh, uh, but as I said, once you do the supracolic part, by the time you come down, it's it's done. If you see my data, there were around 16 cases I was not able to perform these uh, procedures. Yeah. So one interesting case which I remembered, as I said, was a case where uh, I, I did a endoscopy and I was supposed to do a silk sleeve. Now, when you are supposed to do a silk sleeve and that patient was supposedly a young female with a BMI of around 48 uh, and the zipo umbilical distance was pretty high. So I end up dilating the bowel and by the time I was entering inside with the scope, my scope was getting smudged and it became very difficult. It became very messy. Uh, the next time I came in the morning, I, I said, Dr. Phoebe, that see, uh, we are not going to do uh, endoscopies in patients with cells and and he he literally brutally assaulted me he said your principles cannot change if you do cells or pills or anything you do you have to follow the principle either you do it preoperatively or or you do it intraoperatively but you cannot change your principles uh, just because you want to accommodate your comfort uh, the next time i went inside more cautiously using minimalistic air you know a little little more cautious because what the tendency, what we have, we learn from most endoscopies, we continuously keep our hands on that insufflation. Yeah, I know. What I decided is then I learn slowly that I keep half my finger over it and I slowly go inside. And, you know, you just need, just need sufficient air, the optimization of the air inside to just see that cavity. You need not blow it to blast it. So then I, I in SILS patient, I started... Uh, doing it myself and did not permit it fellows to do the endoscopy because fellows are, you know, they take time. They would just put in the air. They want to learn things. They are very excited and, you know, they are a little cautious also. So then I started doing and then next time, you know, I did. So this case series, which we presented is actually, you know, 2000 odd cases. So I'm not talking about one case or two cases or three. We have been, and, and you know, when we planned this webinar, Dr. Phoebe specifically wanted me to demonstrate uh, the intraoperative endoscopy. And I said, I'm going to end it there. So he said, no, you demonstrate the entire case because you can do a mini bypass in odd 18 minutes. 
so let them see that it's possible because when you talk something and do something else it decreases your credibility so let them see that you can do it do the procedure uh, without bypassing the protocols and that would prove your point so that's what i did today you see that uh, we have such few surgeons who have logged in i mean it just shows that people are either not interested maybe webinar burnouts i don't know but there's such little attendance and i'm really surprised with that uh, no, we, um, it's but, really the attendance here does not reflect we are this okay. is on facebook okay this okay is, this is going live on facebook on linkedin yeah. on uh, actually yeah. actually my you won't see a lot of people on zoom because they are already getting it on the facebook okay. on the ibc on the linkedin on youtube channels on instagram so you know the young surgeons they are more uh, they, they like more the social media than going on the zoom and attending a meeting so that's that's it. and plus i'm going to put the recordings everywhere so uh, our intention was to you know have a closed group meeting and then take it to uh, i feel great right about it mohit uh, absolutely uh, correct mohit you absolutely correct the whole idea of the function is just to make learning available on all platforms and everybody who wants to learn i'm not talking about everybody who is already learned but who wants to learn like vale or myself Uh, we should we should learn in any ways we should learn there is no no shortcuts there is no shortcuts no i can i can suggest you you know my linkedin profile i linkedin live i never knew that that's so effective i i am doing this linkedin live and i can send you there are 50 questions there already logged in so the linkedin live probably is becoming more you know surgeons are everywhere and they get one social media platform they can see your video and then they just hook yes. into that and keep on following that Okay, okay let me go now to Wendy. Wendy, do you have any comments? We invited you, and you made this time, and you're all the way in Melbourne. Any comments? No, I think um, we covered a lot of very interesting ground tonight. It's been very interesting, and um, and I take all all the points on board um, about the consent and about um, I guess patient education being a very important part of this. um and i think it's very interesting and you know very good data that you've collected prospectively and it sort of fascinated me how close it is to the meta analysis that we did in the um for the if so position statement that your findings were very similar so yes, um, that was one of the question uh, i got asked when we started well you're doing this endoscopy it averages about 5 minutes from what we see are you going to be able to find a uh, pathology as well as a gastroenterologist does who takes 15 20 minutes and so when we compared our results they are just as good and the findings are almost equal the sometimes the minute gastritis are not picked up by us but we don't miss anything that would make a difference so i want to thank you for your participation i here is see dr marin one you join us can you unmute yourself yeah he okay. he had a he had a very specific question his question is very interesting now he says yes. you you go ahead and you wanted to do a gastric bypass but suppose you find a duodenal polyp and you did end up doing a sleeve now what about the comorbidities now the patient is diabetic so you give him a procedure which so what is your answer dr phobi can answer that answer remember a sleeve is a metabolic operation uh from all the data we got that the gastric bypass is more effective in treating a diabetic uh but again you give the patient the best operation at that time which is a sleeve because you're worried about malignancy and uh we know that people who are in cancer endemic areas like in korea and japan uh would normally do a sleeve if we really feel strong about it we would do the sleeve and then do a duodenal jejunal room while gastric bypass that is a sleeve bypass which is an accepted treatment in a patient whom you think really needs it it's a slightly more complicated operation than a regular row y but it's a very popular operation that is done in china and is done in taipei taiwan and japan because those areas are also and cancer endemic areas 
Dr. Manish Keta and the other panelists, any comments or questions who would be closing the session? Manish? Dr. Phobi, can I ask something in the meanwhile? Sure. Yes. Something about what Mohit just mentioned and what you uh, answered just now. So, uh, uh, of late, when we want to do a bypass, instead of doing OAGB or an MGB, we have been, uh, and also instead of doing a classical SASE, because we found nutritional issues with SASE, we do a sleeve with a 200 centimeter BP link. So, so it's actually like a, nearly like a GJ. Uh, so we do a sleeve and a gastro uh, jejunal anastomosis at 200 centimeters. That's so, right. That's a loop. That's a loop. Uh, with a loop. Yes. 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 Yeah, so if you do a procedure like this, if you have your polyp and the duodenum or whatever, you have surveillance of the sleeve stomach, you have the duodenum, and you have endoscopy of the, of the anastomosis also. And there, yes. is, there is no blind area in this procedure. And we, we are finding the results of this so good that we now are tending to do more and more of these and uh, in some time we will we'll get our data out and uh, where I will propose that we would be able to replace a OAGB by a procedure like this. And Definitely. Uh, that work has been done by C.K. Wong who, and he's published on it with long-term follow-up. Okay. And that is the topic of a future seminar, a sleeve through wide gastric bypass and the merits. And uh, it turns out to be slightly less complicated than was thought because you're doing most of the dissection right above the supercolic area and you don't have to go right up there to the GE junction. Okay, yeah, with yeah. that, uh, Dr. Bandari, if you have any closing remarks, I would appreciate it are, because are, we're going to this at 90 minutes. Yes, there are two questions which somebody has asked. If you permit, I can answer them. They, they, they are they're asking about uh, post-op endoscopies, which we perform. Yes. So they're saying that on-table endoscopies just after performing the procedure, will it cause leaks? Uh, I personally don't think so. You have to be cautious while handling the scope. As I said, minimal air and be very cautious. If you have a leak or something, try and repair it because fresh repairs, they, they all stay there. And if you feel that there is a larger leak, maybe refashion, but be cautious and that can happen. That's a possibility which, which one should be careful about while doing post-op endoscopies. Don't push in a lot of air because you have blocked the distal passage. So that creates a very high pressure zone there. Number two about narrow band imaging in uh, bariatric surgery. We have not much of an experience with that, but just to begin uh, with some training, we started using the NBI mode to check for the ulcers, to check for gastritis, not immediate preoperative, but mostly postoperative when we do these endoscopies in follow-ups. Uh, we are using NBI now very regularly to check for ulcers and barrets and anastomotic ulcers and things like that. So that's that's these are the two questions which I had. I think apart from that, I'm I'm good. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank all the participants and the audience, uh, particularly Dr. Brown from Melbourne and Dr. Ketan, our panelists from Ahmedabad, and I want to thank Dr. Ba uh, Mohit Bandari. Uh, at this time, I'll put a plug for the VBU. It's a virtual bariatric university that is being set up from Mohawk Bariatric and Robotic Surgery Center. It's a weekly session that's going to be every Monday. We're going to address various topics. And next week, at the same time, we'll be looking at what is called a long tube gastric bypass. Some call it a diverted MGB. Some call it a gastric bypass for a long BP limb and a long tube. Hopefully, by bringing that to light and discussion, uh, we would uh, give one more operation to surgeons to put in the armamentarium. And then we're going to find out that there are going to be cases where we might end up doing a procedure in a patient in whom there might have been a contraindication. For instance, Right now, we say hydra hernia and reflux is a contraindication for all patients with uh, MGB. Now, we have shown that patients with MGB with reflux, we treat them with a long tube gastric bypass or a diverted MGB. Well, why can't we just do that in the beginning? That is the question. 
And that will be the discussion for next week. Thank you all. Thank you, Himanshu, on the video team. Thank and we'll you. see you. Dr. Bobby, wish you a very happy birthday. Yeah, wish you a happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Mel. Thank you very much for including me. Thank you, Thank you very much. We're on the team and yeah. keep up the good work. Namaste. <laughs>